Thank you for joining us for this month's Virtual Curators Tour. I'm Jenna Gilley, Associate Curator of Exhibitions at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, and I'll be your guide today. We will be looking at the exhibition William S. Dutterer, Below the Surface, A Deep Sea, created by Collection Information Specialist Sue Slick and created in partnership with the William S. Dutterer Trust. William Sherman Dutterer, 1943 to 2007, was born and raised in a blue-collar neighborhood in Hagerstown, a railroad city in Western Maryland. Happy childhood experiences in neighboring West Virginia with his extended family set deep roots in his soul and forged an enduring attachment to rural America. In 1961, Dutter began undergraduate studies at MICA, Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. He was one of the first MFA graduates of the newly formed Hofburger School of Painting under the direction of second-generation abstract expressionist Grace Hartigan. Upon earning his MFA in 1967, Dutter began teaching at the Washington, D.C. Corcoran School of Art. In 1979, he and his wife, Jamie Johnson Dutter, left the tightly insulated Washington, D.C. art community for New York City. The artist commuted between the two cities for several years to continue teaching painting at Corcoran. Dutter's life was cut short by cancer in 2007, and Jamie founded the William S. Dutter Trust in 2017 to preserve his legacy. We are grateful to Jamie and the William S. Dutter Trust for the generous gift of Dutter's work to the Fort Wayne Museum of Art and for their assistance with this exhibition. Dutter hit the ground running upon graduating from MICA. His first foray into art in the late 60s and early 70s fell into the then rising minimalist movement, which focused on the formalist principle that art should be studied solely by the way it was made and what it looks like. In this highly reductive painting titled Number Four, a thin reflective silver border surrounds a rectangle of medium gray blue. The last of Dutter's light and surface series, the painting shows that Dutter was thinking about the environment as well as the work itself. While it may seem quite simple, this painting examines how light is both reflected and absorbed, and how these two gray tones shift in color as the viewer changes position, or as light changes throughout the day or in the gallery. It can be seen as a portal, a mirror, door, or simply a thing. Number four is also one of the largest paintings of this type made by Dutter, who stated it was big enough to be monumental, but small enough so that the whole picture can be seen at once. This start in minimalism would continue throughout Dutter's career with his constant interest in surfaces, texture, and materials. While these early works gained him great accolades, like many other artist artists, Dutter did not want to be confined into a singular artistic style or box. He began creating cut and folded canvases next, which were still quite minimal but incorporated a more playful narrative tone. This untitled cut and folded study was a preparation for an actual cut canvas, garment-like deconstructions that flirted with three dimensions. The creases, openings, and notches of these cut and folded paintings subtly investigated the properties of surfaces, but unlike their silver and gray paintings, they revealed the normally hidden back of the canvas, another surface. Some were unstretched and attached to the wall with devices hidden under the flaps and folds of the material that made them appear to float on the wall. While they are also very simple, these progression-like pieces began to explore the idea of encapsulating a story through art. Like Andy Warhol's early kitschy diagram paintings, one can imagine this piece as a mini origami lesson found in a craft magazine. In another artistic change of direction, Dutter became more interested in this narrative tone. His work became expressive, cartoonish, and figural. Perhaps this was also aided by the artist receiving his first tattoo in 1973, a cathartic milestone. It is in this era that Dutter revealed his first main character, Joe Diver. Here in Embrace, we see Joe Diver encounter a blue octopus, although it is unclear if this is a friendly or unwanted embrace. 
Joe Diver is an everyman who visits strange worlds and hostile elements, knitted in his protective suit, helmet, and umbilical cord-like air hose. Those who knew Dutter say he was plumbing the depths of his own psyche in these compelling and mysterious underwater images. Joe Diver is focused on seeing, though he is encumbered by a sight-obstructing diving helmet. Like the masks, face covers, and wrappings that would become key elements of Dutter's visual lexicon at the end of his life, Joe Diver's helmet hides his face. On his quest to see, he is unseen. In his adventures with colorful undersea creatures, Dutter's humor, which often took the form of silly doodles, is apparent. In 1990, Dutter suffered a burst appendix while he and his wife Jamie were antiquing in upstate New York. Too sick to travel, he convalesced at the home of a colleague. Bedridden and alone for weeks, he lay still, listening to the sounds of the nearby trains running up and down the lines that follow the Hudson River. Trains, a familiar element of his boyhood. Unable to get up and paint, and terrified of boredom, Dutter filled a sketchbook with images of bulbous locomotives bellowing through the dark, an example seen here in Untitled Train. These locomotives take on personas with eyes, mouths, and great booming voices. The idea of sound amplified through an energetic background of scribbles. Their headlamp beams bore through the night, seeing in the dark like Dutter's character Joe Diver's deep sea companions. Dutter's recovery progressed as he explored the visual portrayals of the voices of the trains. But in 1993, another medical crisis a traumatic fall resulting in multiple fractures in both legs restricted Dutter to a year in a wheelchair. Unable to work on large canvases, he again explored the train motif, continuing his experimentation with the visual representation of sound. Hundreds of sketches of locomotives and images of the blast of their horns were recorded in stacks of sketchbooks that led to numerous canvases. Dutter's final series of masked or faceless heads is perhaps in the same vein as his other career turns, both a 180 twist and a progressive building of past explorations. Continuing on his journey of narrative figural work and past in minimalism, the forms here are quite spare, floating in nondescript space. However, while his previous train series focused on the amplification of sound, these works focus on its restriction. Created in response to witnessing the fall of the Twin Towers in the September 11, 2001 attacks and the subsequent War on Terrorism, First Casualty depicts a head-like shape which has a black covering over the top portion of its skull, presumably covering its eyes, while a small red mask bounds its mouth. Dutter has also added text to the piece, The first casualty of war is the truth referencing a quote attributed to Senator Hiram Johnson in 1917 at the start of the First World War, which resurfaced during the Vietnam War era. Though Dutter was not among those sent into that bloody conflict, he could easily have been among the cohort of young Americans who did not return. While it is easy to assume that the bound, gagged, wrapped, and blindfolded heads that Dutter created post 9-11 are all anti-war images or commentaries on the Taliban and its destruction of Afghan society, they are far more mysterious and enigmatic. They are symbols of societal injustice and hardship, but their universality makes them applicable to many situations, both personal and worldwide. Thank you for joining me for this virtual curator's tour. We are so pleased to honor the life and work of Bill Dutterer, a truly amazing artist who never stops seeing beyond the conventional. To learn his full story and encounter more of his works, I encourage you to see William S. Dutterer below the surface, a deep sea, in person before it closes on July 9th. <laughs>